Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So great to see, or not to see, uh, so many of you here today. Um, my name is Henrietta Jackson Stops, and I run IPOS Mediation alongside my own mediation practice. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a panel of 32 mediators with a broad range of experience and skills. We've been in the business of providing mediators um, to the market for over 25 years. Um, so we have a huge amount of experience between us, which I've recently added up. And I think we've mediated close to 20,000 cases between us. Um, what, what sets us apart, I think, is the quality and expertise of the mediators that we can offer. We cover a broad range of disputes from commercial through workplace, employment, public sector, and family business and trusts and the public sector. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by one of our leading mediators, Rebecca Clark. Rebecca has been a lawyer, a business owner, and head of litigation at a so-called bad bank. So she's seen mediation from all sides of the table. Uh, she has a particular interest in the psychology of mediation and negotiation. So I'm particularly, um, I'm really looking forward to um, hearing from her today. I would like to make this session as interactive as possible and encourage questions which please put in the Q&A at the bottom. Uh, just so we can get an idea of your collective experience I'm just launching a quick poll um, so that we know um, have an idea of who we're talking to. If you could uh, respond on screen now that would be great. Thank you. The answers are flooding in. Um, and we've got about 78% whose main area of practice is as a lawyer. Um, and many, about 36% of you have done, attended 25 plus mediations um, and a quarter uh, between 11 and 25 mediations. So we've got a good range of experience. Um, that's really interesting. Thank you very much. And having uh, share that information. I would like to hand over to Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. And uh... My pleasure. Right, I am going to share my screen. Excellent. So, this um, seminar is called Mediation Mind Games. As Hetty said, I'm really interested in how the mind works in a mediation situation. And I'm going to touch on the psychological influences at play in a dispute, but also the physical influences, particularly in relation to how the brain works. Big caveat here, uh, you'll have gathered from Hetty's introduction that I'm not a learned professor in either of these matters. So what I'm going to talk about is a mixture between what I've learned through my own research and interests, but also what I have experienced as a mediator and as a mediated party. And I think it's partly because I, uh, I realised how, uh, how important these mind games are as a mediating party that I've got a particular interest in this area now as a mediator. Now, rather than talking in abstract, I'm going to go through the typical life cycle of a dispute and walk through some of the things that might be happening at each stage. And I'm gonna mix a bit of science with some practical considerations and tips. So first I'm going to look at why the dispute has arisen, then what preparations can or should be done for a mediation including looking at position papers and joint meetings, and then look at negotiation and techniques for breaking deadlock. As Hetty said, if this was in person, I would want it to be really informal with lots of interaction and questions, which is really hard to do on Zoom. But please do ask questions and we'll try and get through some of them at the end of the session. So let's start with preparing for the mediation. And I think from a mind games perspective, the first thing it's useful to look at here is why the dispute has arisen. People don't arrive at a mediation um, without some context. So I think to get some understanding of this is quite useful. And when I talk about this, I'm, I'm not meaning who has practically done what in terms of breaching contract, etc. 
but approaching the question of dispute creation from a neural and psychological perspective. So I'm just going to spend five minutes exploring the science of this uh, because I've, I find this really fascinating uh, before moving on to kind of less theoretical uh, and more practical matters. So our understanding of, of disputes and, and our brain is developing at a rapid rate. And at a very basic level, disputes are about survival. And as human beings, we're concerned with three levels of survival. There's physical survival, so the kind of do I have enough? And I think it's quite easy to see that how that can translate into a dispute over property, money, um, things like that. Social survival is a second strand. And again, this is quite easy to understand. I think on a basic level as humans, we crave love and acceptance and belonging. And obviously those sort of social instincts were fundamental to our survival as a species and, and as a group. But psychological survival is perhaps something um, with which certainly we lawyers are less familiar. And psychological survival has two strands really. It's about having stability in self-identity and a coherent and consistent understanding of the world. So a really quick bit of neuroscience. We now know that our brains encode all of our experiences or stimuli in neurons within the brain. So our ability to think, believe, know, learn, remember, understand are all a function of the brain's ability to encode experiences or stimuli in these neural structures. And interestingly, this means that our knowing is self-embodied because it's stored in the brain. What we, what we know is who we are. So we are what we know, quite literally. And because our knowing is embodied and what we know is what we are, our self-identity is also embodied meaning our self-identity is a psychological survival we're talking about here. We can be really attached to ideas and information that are integral to our sense of self and thus to our self-esteem. And according to some experts in dispute resolution, self-esteem is the single most powerful motivating factor in all conflict in human existence. So at a fundamental level, war, and at a less fundamental level, a commercial dispute. And that's because we all, either consciously or unconsciously, spend an inordinate amount of time maintaining and protecting our own self-esteem. We need to, because as I've said, we are what we know, experience and believe. It's important that we approve and think well of ourselves and that we are approved of and thought well of by others, whether that's family members, your employer, your board of directors, your partner, or even your fellow disputant. But self-esteem is also wider than a consideration of your neural structures and that it's not limited to humans. So companies can have self-esteem, even countries can have self-esteem. If you think about the boost to the UK for it, for example, when hosting the 2012 Olympics. So self-esteem is eroded when people think or believe that they are being disrespected or treated unfairly. And I think we can be really dismissive as adults when we complain of things being unfair, but actually being treated fairly is an innate animal instinct. And the best example of this, and, and apologies if you've seen this before, but I, I do think it, uh, it, it can be rewatched several times, is Franz de Waal's TED talk, uh, where he talks about some experiments that they did um, in relation to fairness uh, on capuchin monkeys. I'm going to ask Hetty to hopefully share her screen. So it's about a two minute. The final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and I'm gonna show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. 
So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. But that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. He gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. So I, I don't think there's a much uh, better example of, of, of how important uh, our, our self-esteem and fairness is to us. And I think it, it's quite interesting when you look at the comments underneath that YouTube video, everybody um, is feeling really sorry for that monkey. You know, there's a real sense of pity for that monkey saying, you know, people saying, well, they should, he should have thrown the rock, not just the uh, cucumber. And interestingly, um, uh, Franz Val talks about them repeating the experiment on chimpanzees and when they did it with chimpanzees the chimpanzee who got the grapes refused to accept the grapes until his fellow chimpanzee got grapes too so this kind of, uh, of innate uh, instinct is, is what we're talking about in terms of our self-esteem so kind of bringing it back to legal disputes, <clears throat> I think from the claimant's perspective, if a breach of contract or an act of negligence can seem an affront. So who, who do they take me for? How dare they treat me like this? There's a perceived injustice or disrespect or unfairness and that dents our self-esteem. And from a defendant's perspective, the humiliation and the disapproval come from the accusation of negligence or breach of contract or worse still, dishonesty. And that can be very damaging to self-esteem because we have to believe we've conducted ourselves properly and are highly principled in order to maintain our own self-esteem. And that's what's being, that is reflected in what's happening in our neural pathways too. Our brain likes consistency. We like traveling down the same neural pathways. And our, as I've said, our sense of self is embodied in those neural pathways in what we think. So when something happens which disturbs those roots, when there's a betrayal, for example, this shatters our understanding of the external world and of the self, and it calls into question the reliability of one's own perceptions, and it can be really unsettling. And we all like to be a positive character in the stories that we tell ourselves, and we strive to create and maintain positive self-narratives, and we don't like it when those stories are challenged. So we enter into disputes to protect ourselves uh, physically, socially, psychologically. 
Okay, so that's the kind of uh, um, scientific part of today's seminar over and done with. And we've looked at the creation of disputes, um, but, but now we have an idea of how people might be arriving uh, or preparing themselves for a mediation context. So looking at uh, potential resolution of disputes through mediation, let's look first at preparation. Preparation is key, uh, it's an obvious point that it can be easily overlooked, particularly by those who are really familiar with the process or whose clients are familiar. Because I'm not just talking about what you and your client need to have done to be prepared, but what you need to do to help the other side to ensure that they're properly prepared. If, if you think in, of preparation in terms of exchange of information, I've said that humans are constantly reacting to new stimulus or information and our brains are then coding that and storing it in our neurons. So when we get a new piece of information as a human, there are four main responses. Firstly, we assign meaning to that information. So we want to know where it fits within our own perceptions or pathways. Secondly, we have an inherent dislike of unknowns. Thirdly, we tend to ignore the familiar because it doesn't challenge our pathways. And fourthly, and interesting, we have a mixed response to learning. So on the one hand, as humans, we're eager to learn because that's how we have developed as a species and we need to understand the characteristics of the environment that we're in. But on the other hand, we can be really resistant to information which contradicts past learning, which disrupts our pathways and makes us feel uncomfortable. So one of the most important things when preparing for a mediation, in my view, is not just to identify what information it is that you need to make a decision, but what information you think your counterparty might need. And that could be information that they might not even ask for because they might not realise they need it or that it's important. And speaking to many of my mediator colleagues, one of the main reasons why mediations don't result in settlement on the day is that there is a new piece of information revealed at the mediation, which throws into question someone's understanding of the position. And from a practical point of view, you can see that that information might need verifying, checking for accuracy, et cetera. But on a psychological level, it can really take time for the brain to adapt to a new interpretation of events and to make new neural pathways and for that party to adjust their attitude to risk. You know, if, if I'm having a Simon Cowell-esque moment, I, I will we'll talk about mediation being a journey. And sometimes it can just be too far for one person to travel in a day. And actually those can be the mediations that settle shortly after the mediation day. So let's look at pre-mediation contact. All mediators will habitually contact the legal representatives of a disputant party before a mediation. One thing I've always done is to try and speak to the parties themselves too before a mediation, having obtained agreement, of course, from their legal team. And I suspect that comes from having been a client so many times at a mediation. And my innate sense was that the storytelling part of the mediation and I don't mean that in a derogatory way but you know the the part where the clients explain to the mediator um, exactly what the case is about and how angry they are about it and uh, and make sure the, the mediator hears that it was a really important part of, of why the process works and I saw that myself actually because even though I attended hundreds of mediations and I knew that the mediator was neutral and wasn't there to make a decision, I found it really important to, to uh, make sure the mediator understood what our case was, why we felt so strongly about it, what the correct law was in our view, etc. But I also knew how irate that could make me at the start of the day. So it would really get everybody wound up and fired up talking about how great their case is and how angry they are to be here. Um, and then you kind of expected to put that to one side and, and look at settlement. So what I try to do now is, is to get that storytelling part of um, a mediation done before the start of the mediation, because it helps me get a better understanding of the pressures and sensitivities from the horse's mouth, but it gives the client the comfort of being heard and listened to 
And I find that people approach the day in a different mindset because they're not there to relive the events that have led them there, but to focus on finding a solution. And actually doing mediations on Zoom has made this um, much easier because certainly at IPOS, we um, get everyone together in their respective teams before a mediation to make sure that all the tech works. And it's a really good opportunity for us to speak to clients before the mediation. And it's interesting that, that this kind of pre-mediation contact is reflected in what I've now learned about how the brain works. So we like to be heard and listened to because it reinforces our neural pathways. And we feel those pathways reflected in the listener and, and we feel validated. Written position papers are another important part of preparation and it's customary to exchange these, but it's also important to look at their purpose and how they're drafted. Interestingly, every time we see something written down, we have more belief that it's true. And again, this can be explained by the phenomenon of, of reinforcement of neural structures, but it's also worth looking at some of the psychological influences at play here. There's a really good book by Robert Cialdini called Influence the Power of Persuasion. And he's looked at the psychology of why people say yes, which frankly is critical and it's, it's basically what you're trying to do in a, in a negotiation and has come up with six universe, universal principles, which he says are in play in any persuasion or negotiation. And these universal principles are automatic, instinctive responses or shortcuts, if you like, that we use to make decisions. And one of these, which is relevant to position papers, is commitment and consistency. So once we have made a choice or taken a stand, we feel internal pressure to behave consistently with it. And he, he refers to an experiment done at a GP surgery where there was an 18% reduction in missed appointments simply by making the patients write down the date and time of their own appointments rather than handing them a card with it on. And that's because we have an instinctive desire to be consistent because it's positively associated with logic and rationality and strength, and it's the decision-making shortcut. It's easier to act in the way we've always have, as it saves time and it, and it prevents having to make choices. And it's linked back to self-esteem again. So people want to act in a way to maintain their self-esteem. And one way to do this is, is with commitment and consistency. So, I think this is really interesting because if you look at how litigation is run in this country, um, once a party has articulated a dispute, written their letter before action or letter in response, drafted their claim form, their defence, etc., their witness statements even, in fact, every time they articulate their position, their confidence in the rightness of their position increases. And, it, and it's not interesting, it's not limited to just, just the party's confidence, it's the legal representative's confidence in the rightness of their position too. So why do we write position papers? And what impact is writing that position paper going to have? What's their purpose? So they, it might be to brief the mediator, um, and that can be really useful, clearly. Um, it, it can also be useful if there's a mixture of uh, perhaps one that's exchanged with the other side and one that's uh, for the mediator's eye only so that you get the confidential information. But there are different ways to brief the mediator and sometimes a telephone conversation. I, I prefer a telephone conversation, in fact. And if there are um, clear pleadings, you know, is it worth, is, is, there, use, is there any use in, in summarising those in a position paper? for the, if they're just going to repeat exactly what's in the papers that the mediator is going to see anyway. The more interesting use of the position paper, I think, is to inform the other party. So to provide some information or to, to set some expectations. I think you can almost guarantee that if there is one document the client is going to read from the other side, it's going to be your position paper. 
So it's a good opportunity to speak direct. But there's a huge caveat to that, which is that it can be really useful if you give them the position paper with time for them to absorb what's in it and, and to deal with the information and to go through this neural pathways process before arriving at the mediation. There's little purpose giving a load of new information or, or managing expectations in a position paper that served the night before the mediation. And then coming back, I think it's really important to be aware of the danger of, of position papers. So our clients read the position papers, they get involved in the drafting. And once they've written the position paper, as I said, there's this um, uh, compulsion to be consistent with it. And consider how some of them are written. Um, they tend to emphasize how strong one person's uh, case is and, and how poor the other person's case is. So a client drafting or reading that paper, it's, uh, it's gonna become more entrenched in that position, whether neurally uh, or psychologically. And therefore it, it's just worth bearing that in mind um, when in reality, you're then going to be asking your client to compromise and, and potentially move away from, from their stated more extreme position. Right. Joint meetings. Uh, this is a, a thorny, thorny subject. And actually, I think, Hetty, we've got another poll, haven't we, around joint meetings. So Hetty has put up a poll here. Do you find joint meetings useful? Okay, I think it's clear. There we are. Excellent. Well, that that's good uh, because I'm in. I personally am in favour of a joint meeting, uh, on the proviso that they're set up properly, i.e., that people come to the mediation having had a discussion about what that meeting might look like and what they might be expected to do. Um, success of a joint meeting is all in the preparation, including the preparation done by the mediator in terms of setting the, set, setting the tone. And thankfully, uh, gone are the days of people reading out position papers in a joint meeting. The most successful meetings in my experience are those where people use it as an opportunity to genuinely exchange information about their position or to table the questions which they feel they need answers to in order to move forward to consider settlement. No questions that don't necessarily need to be answered during the joint session themselves, but it's really useful to get them all tabled so that people can go away and think about them and, and decide how they want to provide that information. And um, there are scientific reasons why a joint meeting works. So, I've spoken already about how it, it important it is for somebody to be heard and listened to from a neural perspective. And there's no need, interestingly, to agree with what's being said. It's the listening in particular that's important. Uh, and, and obviously by listening, you, you may actually be surprised what you learn. Um, but the most effective joint meetings can be where clients themselves feel comfortable to speak I did a mediation um, about a year ago of a very, very, very long running dispute between um, a claimant and a bank, a claimant business um, and its directors. And they, um, the bank had withdrawn banking facilities on a seemingly random basis. And this had had a hugely detrimental effect on the business itself. The bank admitted that they'd messed up in withdrawing the facilities. The question, the dispute was around the consequences of this. Uh, the bank had really not accepted at all that, that, that uh, it could have caused the level of damage to the business that the claimants said that it did. And the claimants did a um, prepared a lot of information for the joint ses session, um, uh, provided a lot of background information and financial information but also explained in their own words and with a considerable amount of emotion, the impact that this had had on their business, their livelihoods, 
their marriage, their mental health. Um, and it was, it, it was exceptionally compelling. Um, and the a representative from the bank dealt with it superbly by listening, remaining engaged. Um, and actually that mediation wound up not settling because it, I think it was the first time the bank had really listened to the impact it, uh, this had had on the claimant's business and actually didn't have the right mandate to settle that day. But they, they explained that and the mediation ended, it was adjourned and, and settled. So I think where clients feel comfortable speaking, that can be really compelling. Also, it, perhaps it, it, the, there can be cases where people won't have met. So perhaps if you have um, like a banker and an insurer, those individuals representing um, their organisations might not have met. And it can be an opportunity to build some relationships that might be useful later. And it, it can be amazing what a, a cordial start can do, um, not least in preventing demonisation with people tend to use language like the people in the other the other side um, and we tend to forget that the other side are actually human beings uh, rather than this this uh, demon entity there's some interesting psychological inf uh, information here too again from Robert Cialdini um, one of his other universal principles is around liking we are more likely to say yes to people that we like and it's really interesting when you think about the body language that you sometimes see. I have to say less often these days, but you, but you, you used to see a lot in a joint meeting of people kind of harumphing around and tapping their fingers and tutting. Uh, and whether that actually uh, is, is a benefit, I understand it's a way to, to express dissatisfaction and disagreement, but actually if you're looking at the liking principle, it's, it's positively counterproductive. And Cialdini talks about some negotiation studies carried out at American business uh, schools where there were two groups of people uh, told to negotiate a deal. And in the first group, the people were told, you know, time is money, get straight down to business. And in that group, 55% came to an agreement. But the second group were told to sit down and, and exchange just one piece of personal information with each other before you start negotiating. And in that group, 90% came to a successful outcome or reached an agreement. And that agreement was typically worth 18% more to both parties. So liking it, it, it is underrated, but really quite important. One thing people can be really worried about in a joint meeting is emotion. And I referred earlier to, to the um, case with, with the bank where the emotion came out in the meeting. And in my view, that was actually transformational. But people can be very nervous about managing emotion in a joint meeting. I think in my uh, experience and view, if emotions are there, it's actually best to get them out uh, because they're present even if they're not spoken about. And if they're spoken, you know what you're dealing with. And it's better for them to come out at the start of the day rather than at five o'clock when everybody's really had enough. And again, this is borne out by neuroscience. I think we have a tendency to separate emotional and rational content. Um, but actually, recent research is suggesting that this is really wrong. So we make a distinction in our language uh, so that we can speak about aspects of our experience, so whether something's rational or emotional. But just because we use the language, it doesn't mean that they actually are separate in terms of processes in the brain. So cognition is a mix of reasoning capacity and emotional response. And people who have brain damage, um, for example, as a result of injury or a tumour, and who can't feel emotion, actually have more difficulty than most in making decisions. So we have to take into account emotional and rational responses in our decision making. So I think in a joint meeting, on one hand, we, we perhaps want to moderate and manage emotional activity so that it doesn't overwhelm communication, but ignoring it or, or denying the response, the emotional response won't make them go away and will likely cause those emotions to interfere with sound decision making and, and durable agreements. Right. Negotiation. We're at the mediation. Um, 
what can um, mediation mind games tell us about negotiation and what, what might work and what might not work? So I think uh, theory and experience, and certainly for those people who've, who've uh, been to lots of mediations, uh, you'll be aware that uh, making an offer in the insult zone, so perhaps a nuisance value only offer, generally will prompt a response in the same insult zone back. Uh, often leading to a salami slicing negotiation. We, um, we feel compelled uh, to respond in kind. Uh, again, that's another one of Cialdini's um, universal principles, uh, reciprocity, uh, which I'll come back to talk about in a bit. Some experts suggest that whoever makes the first offer in the credible zone has control of the negotiation on the day. And certainly if you make the first offer and it's outside of the insult zone, it's actually really hard for the other side to then put their counter offer into the insult zone. Don't go in with a first and final offer. People attend a mediation with the intention and, and uh, expectation to negotiate and being deprived of that leads to frustration and potential loss of self-esteem. Put logic behind the offer and break it down as much as possible. So part of the offer might be acceptable. And even if not, the logic and the, and the breaking down can provide a useful structure for people to exchange offers as, as the day goes on. Think about how you phrase the offer. It's, it's really important um, to think about this. It, it, the fear of losing something is more motivational than the prospect of gaining something of equal value. So people who sell home insulation, for example, focus on what people are losing on bills per month by not having it, rather than what they'll save if they install it, even though the figure is the same. And then the other um, tip um, is, is around expectations. So when I was on the CEDAR course, they had done some um, informal research about the number of offers um, each side tend to make in a typical mediation, to the extent there is a typical mediation. They looked over, over a number of, well, obviously, hundreds of different mediations. And they worked out that generally, in an average mediation, people make and receive three offers. And I think that's really interesting and actually quite useful to know. And, and I, I was still at the bank when I attended the CEDA course. So in my subsequent mediations as a client, I kind of worked this through in my, and it was around three. And I think it's something around people um, coming to negotiate, not wanting it to go on all night, feel that they've tested the water and they can have some confidence that they can't push each other much further, but also knowing that if they push too far, the whole thing might collapse. So it might just be worth bearing that in mind when you go into a, a mediation in terms of managing clients' expectations and what the day might look like. Obviously, it depends upon your, your type of mediation, but it, I think it can be quite useful. So let's look at some of the mind games that might be going on in a negotiation. I have obviously talked about several of Robert Cialdini's already, so I've talked about liking. I've talked about commitment and consistency, um, which is certainly in play when we come to negotiate. So remember this principle says that once we've made a, a choice or taken a stand, we feel pressurized to behave consistently with it. I don't know if any of you have placed, well, I presume quite a few of you have placed a bet on a horse or, or uh, bought a lottery ticket. And once you've done that, your level of confidence that you will win, your level of confidence rises substantially because we have to think that we've got a good chance of winning. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to have bought the ticket. And again, like I said, once we've determined a legal strategy or put it down in a position paper, our confidence in it raises substantially. And acting consistently raises our self-esteem. And the relevance for mediation is to try and avoid backing people into corners. So compromise often means a move from your state of position. And in that, in that way, you're acting inconsistently. And we quite often hear language such as, why should we compromise? If we go to court, we'll win everything. 
And I think it's really interesting here to think of the concept of a golden bridge, which is, a, is not my concept. It's a fourth century BC Chinese military strategist called Sun Tzu, who wrote, a wise conquering general is one who builds a golden bridge upon which his defeated enemy can retreat. And I think what he means by that is if someone's given a dignified exit route out of a dispute, one that enables them to save face and, and maintain their self-esteem, they're more likely to take it. But if, if you're going to encounter nothing but shame and defeat, then you have little option but to fight because it's only through fighting that you can regain your self-esteem. So one way to look at this, at this is, is there a concession upon which the other party might use to save face? So you'll hear language such, well, if only you'd disclosed this earlier, or if only we'd known about this document, we, we would have done this earlier, sooner. So it's people acknowledging that they would have acted differently had they known, which is really a pretext for saying something new and moving on. And the nice thing about a concession is it feeds into another one of Cialdini's theories, which is reciprocity, which I mentioned earlier. So if somebody does something, we feel obliged to do something consistent in return. So a university professor in America tested this theory by sending Christmas cards out to people from um, the phone book or the, the yellow pages, people he didn't know. And he got so many replies back from people that he also didn't know. So let's look finally at techniques for breaking deadlock. Firstly, it, deadlock is normal, uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Let's look at why it's happened. So it might happen uh, for, because of very straightforward reasons. So for example, as I referred to earlier case, there may be an insufficient mandate in place, or there might be some missing information um, that parties uh, agree that they need to see before they can settle. And in my view, the best thing to do there is to agree a timetable to move forward. But if it's not straightforward, what's going on? Why is there a deadlock? People often um, poo-poo the uh, kind of information exchanging part at the beginning of a mediation. So we quite often hear people saying, oh, do we need to do this? Why can't we move, you know, we're going to get onto numbers. Why can't we get straight down to numbers now? And to be fair, it's not something that didn't go through my mind when I was a client in a mediation. The thing is, people need to build confidence and believe that the other side is acting in good faith before sensible offers can be made. It's, it's very difficult to get straight to figures and you are more likely to get a deadlock in this situation. I talked earlier about how our memories and our stories are stored in our neural pathways and that as humans, we're constantly striving to assimilate new information into those pathways and we assign meaning thing, meanings to things and we dislike information which uh, contradicts our established pattern. And as humans, we are really good at rationalizing and debating and looking at things from different angles and considering nuances, but it's very difficult for us to actively believe two contrary things at the same time. So people need time to do that assimilation and move from a I am right, you are wrong position um, to uh, well, maybe I can see that there might be a different version of events or even I can see that there's a chance a judge will prefer that ver version of events over mine. Um, and it's by going through that process that be it becomes less of a threat to your sense of self-esteem and you're more likely to take it into account. And actually that can be why it can be really difficult if the decision maker or the person holding the mandate is not at the mediation because they're not being taken on that X factor journey with, with the participants of the mediation. The other thing that's interesting in terms of deadlock is around um, yeah, in, insufficient information exchange is around your amygdala hijack. So your amygdala is um, a structure in your brain responsible for fight or flight, uh, which was clearly vital when we were running from uh, wildebeest and, and it means that uh, your body takes control of your rational thinking brain. Uh, it puts it to one side to produce a fast physical response and you get a massive surge in adrenaline and cortisol. 
And this hijacking can actually easily happen in the context of a dispute where something somebody says is seen as a threat, albeit not physical, but perhaps of wrong, wrongdoing or an imputation of fault or negligence, etc. And people who have an amygdala hijack um, can't think rationally. Um, so if this has happened to your opponent, they actually need time for those chemicals to leave their body. And there's an old wives tale about taking a, you know, take a walk outside, get some fresh air. Actually, that really does work. Uh, these old wives tales are often uh, based on some kind of truth, but the going outside and taking deep breaths actually causes these chemicals to dissipate and your rational brain can, can kick back into gear. Other things to look at with deadlock, um, come back to Cialdini's theory. So, is there a consistency issue here? Um, would, could you make use of reciprocity? Would making a concession enable them to make a concession in, in return? Have you built a golden bridge? Could you use the liking principle and perhaps put different people together in a room? Um, are, are there, is there a particular dynamic that might work? Could you phrase your offer differently to highlight what they might lose if they don't settle? What happens if there's no settlement? A mediator will always try and get the party to leave on a, a good note. As I've said, sometimes it's a timing issue um, and people need to come to terms with, with the change in their perceptions of their position. Sometimes it can be a very practical issue, for example, the need, uh, the need for a new mandate. But it's always good to agree, if possible, a process to move things forward, what's gonna happen tomorrow, um, rather than leaving things at, at, at a hanging point. Right. I think that brings me to the end. Uh, I appreciate I've talked for a long time. It's a huge potential subject and I've just touched on the bits that I find most interesting. But I hope it's given you a taster of all the different mind games that might be going on psychologically, neurally. Um, and. I'd be really happy to hear any comments or um, people's experiences that perhaps don't accord with what I've said or that do. I'll hand back to Hetty. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really, really interesting and insightful. Um, I've got I've got quite a few questions actually. Um, starting with um, to what extent can or or should the mediator urge the parties to provide a position paper? of real value rather than a rework of the pleadings. Um, human nature results in a tendency of parties led by their lawyers to hold back. And on that point, um, Austin Kenny has made the, 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 the point that actually we shouldn't really be talking about position papers, should we? We should be talking about mediation summaries or case summaries or, or, or something else, which is a conversation I know you and I have had before. Absolutely. Language is really important. Um, and I think there's a, Historically, they've been called position papers, and I, and I did use that language, but actually I do normally call them mediation summaries. But I think there is the fact that there isn't a, a fixed term for them is perhaps uh, reflective of the confusion over their purpose. Um, because I think some people do see them as a position paper, so is a restating of the pleadings. And unless your pleadings are hideously complicated, I really question the need for this. It's an, it's an extra step and it's really an, an expensive step. And what purpose is it serving? Um, so a, a mediation summary, I think, is a better position. And I think the more upfront and open they can be, uh, the, the more prepared parties come to the mediation and people's expectations have been managed more effectively and people have learned something. And it's a, psychologically, it's a move from the dispute and the formal pleadings into thinking, right, we're doing something different here. We're not at court. Is that something that you as the mediator make clear to the parties at the, when, at the point that you're instructed? So I always talk about what papers are going to be provided and whether we're going to have a position paper. And I talk about, I, I, I make it very clear that I'm not really, I don't feel the need for a position paper that is a repeat of the pleadings because I can read the pleadings, it's fine. It's just, a, it's a waste of money and a, and a wasted step and it's very formulaic. So I always say, 
if you want to do a position paper because you think there's something I need to understand or, or there's some signaling you want to give to the other side before the mediation, do it. You can brief me on the telephone and that's often a lot easier and cheaper uh, and I find it more useful because I can ask questions as well. Useful, useful. Um, and a question from John. Um, what if the other side has not behaved consistently? What is the best way to deal with this without backing them into a corner? That's really difficult because we like people to behave in the same way that we behave and we find it very uncomfortable when they don't. Um, and I think it's what I would say is that you're stuck with the people on the other team that you're stuck with. So you can't necessarily change the way that they behave. You can only influence the way that you respond to it. Um, but I think, I think in a way that's where have, having a mediator and doing a mediation rather than a without prejudice settlement meeting can be quite useful because you have the buffer of the mediator who, um, rather than you trying to deal with somebody who you consider unreasonable face to face, you've got the mediator who can uh, provide perhaps a more nuanced response or, or perhaps ask questions and provide challenge that you wouldn't be able to do yourself. Really, really interesting. Um, and there's a question that's come in from how does a quality of arms affect matters? For example, where one party attends with counsel and whereas the other side is fully armed um, with a QC. I think that's, that's interesting. Um, I don't think you need to match arms with arms. I think it's a preparation thing. Um, I used to attend mediations as a client without, I never saw the need to take counsel with me. I was always happy with the, uh, so, uh, the solicitors that I'd instructed. Some clients feel that they need uh, counsel there because they want the extra advice. Sometimes it can be useful to have counsel there because they provide a dynamic that is different from the dynamic between solicitor and client or between solicitor and solicitor. So it can be quite useful from a mediator's perspective to have somebody else to to draw in to on that liking principle and um, so i think it depends on the case it doesn't worry me if things are unbalanced it worries me a lot more if things are unbalanced in terms of the preparation that people have done because i think it can be really frustrating if you arrive at a mediation fully prepared all everything lined up you've spent a lot of time you're ready to go and your perception is that the people in the other room are not. Uh, that's great, thank you. Um, somebody, Jane's asked if you can expand on what you mean by a timetable to move things forward, i.e. timetabling things during the mediation. So um, just very practically, um, quite often you'll find that people divulge financial information, for example, at, at some point in a mediation that uh, needs verifying or, or people need time to go away and think about it and think how that affects their risk profile and it's perhaps a, a sitting down with the two um, parties and saying right you think this information needs providing when are you going to provide x when are you going to provide y at, at a proper timetable to move things forward are we going to reconvene the mediation when are we going to speak to each other um, that's what I mean by a timetable to move things forward. Yeah, um, that's really helpful. Uh, we've um, how another question: so How universal is the psychology you've described, uh, or do you think there are variations with different cultures? I think the, well, that's really interesting. There are definitely variations with cultures, and uh, and uh, mediate international mediations and the differences in cultures is a massive topic and, and really, really fascinating. So Robert Cialdini is American and, and perhaps there is some similarity between American culture and UK culture, even though our legal systems are, are different, they're not massively different. If you start uh, looking at the differences between, say, the, the Far East culture and a more European or American culture, that is very different in terms of self-esteem and face saving and decision making and, and it, it is really it is really fascinating but it's worth looking at 
um, what the cultural norms are for the people that you're mediating with so that you don't kind of accidentally offend somebody uh, when you're not intending to do that and perhaps have some appreciation of how they will they will make their decisions and what will be important Somebody's asked if uh, Anthony's asked if you if you speak to the client before the mediation, do you ask to do it without their lawyer present? And actually, there's a similar question here about. Um, uh, let me just find it. It was along the lines of, oh yes, do you find it helpful when lawyers are involved, or is progress better when the parties negotiate direct? Both questions suggesting that the lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, I don't mind actually whether lawyers are there I'm certainly not trying to exclude lawyers um when we did everything on the phone or by person i used to have the conversations without the lawyers generally present because um it's, it's cheaper for the client and and everything the client says to me is confidential anyway so there's no issue around um them perhaps saying something that the lawyer wouldn't want them to say because it's not going to go anywhere from from my perspective um, and we could have more of a, of a chat and we could chat about mediation generally. Now that we're doing things on Zoom, you tend to have the lawyers and the client in the Zoom meeting, the pre-mediation meeting. So we tend to have um, a meeting with the lawyers there too. Although sometimes the lawyers will drop off and I'll have a, a subsequent meeting with the clients. You don't get actually the same openness from the client when their lawyer is there. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. Uh, perhaps from your lawyer perspective, it's not a good thing. From a mediator's perspective, it is quite a good thing because you're getting um, more, you probably get more emotion uh, um, directly from the client. Yep. Really but I wouldn't speak to the client without checking that the lawyer is happy first, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, uh, somebody else has asked, if this, if you're, and thank you everybody for all your questions, um, trying to get through quickly as possible before our time is up but um if your if your client is unwilling to attend a joint meeting with the other side um uh, how do you approach this and maximize your chances of reaching agreement yeah and that, that's that's a really good question and it's not uncommon the, the i think the beauty of a kind of softly softly so a series of pre-mediation meetings whether that's on zoom or on the phone is that you have the client who, whose initial instinct might be, no, I really don't want to see the other side, has more time to think about the benefits of, of perhaps doing that and get more comfortable with the idea. So firstly, I'd say the earlier that is tabled and discussed between the solicitor, the client and the, and the mediator, the better it is because clients, in my experience, do tend to to come around to the idea or realize that there might be a benefit or actually there is something they'd really like to say if they've got time to prepare it nobody wants to go into a joint meeting unprepared or put on the spot that's just really really uncomfortable i had a really interesting mediation last week and this is something that couldn't have happened before zoom where um it was co uh, co-directors who had really really fallen out but there was a lot of misinformation, factual misinformation between the parties that I could see that they couldn't necessarily see. So I thought there was a real, real benefit in having a joint session, not least so each other's, you want the legal teams to be aware of what the other clients are saying too, because they've only heard the, the what their client has told them. So it can be really useful for them to hear as well. Um, and actually, because the client was so uncomfortable, we had a joint meeting but the clients all turned their cameras off so they couldn't see each other. So they all listened, but they didn't speak and they didn't see each other, which was quite odd. And it was odd for me because I couldn't see what their reactions were, which is quite important for me to be able to see that. But on the other hand, it was better to have that so that they could hear what each other's legal teams were saying than not have a meeting at all. So there are there were way, ways around it and you also don't need to have a joint meeting at the beginning of the day so if the client's uncomfortable you can perhaps have a meeting later in the day or you can have a smaller meeting or yeah that's that's really interesting and i think you know the party has really shown us how the technology can help and i've certainly heard of an instance where in a similar situation actually in a face-to-face -face mediation 
one of the parties couldn't stand bare face being in the room and actually listened in from yeah. another room on a conference. Yeah. So there yeah. are always ways around it to, to, to manage with people. Yes, there are. I um, I'm really grateful for to everybody for their questions and I'm sorry that we haven't got through them but but I, it's, it's 12 o'clock and I don't want to keep you any longer but thank you very much Rebecca for your time. You're very um, welcome. Interesting and sorry that we haven't been able to answer all the questions but of course if you would like Rebecca to answer the questions or have a further conversation with her do get in touch you know either at the info at media.co.uk email address or or, or um, Rebecca via with Rebecca directly um, and if any um, of our clients out there would like uh, Rebecca or any of our other mediators to come in and do an in-house training session on mediation more generally or um, something more specific like the psychology of mediation do get in touch we offer free training sessions um, which are getting booked up so if you are interested in those do get in touch with me um, Thank you, Rebecca, again, for such a great talk. And uh, thank you all for attending. And uh, I hope to see you in person, I hope, um, in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.